Uh, you're currently a guest professor of English literature in Freiburg, um, and you've held previous positions um, at other universities in Vienna, in Tübingen, in Leipzig, and in Got Göttingen, which means you've you've seen a lot of the English departments. That's exciting. Um, Kirsten's research focuses on early modern literature and culture with a particular focus on Shakespeare, on travel writing, colonialism, and uh, on the Atlantic, which basically means you're going across to America, I guess. <laughs> um, and you're interested in, in uh, post-colonial literatures, also in Scottish studies and Canadian studies. You have written a book which is called Scottish Colonial Literature, Writing the Atlantic, 1603 to 1707, which was published in uh, 2021 at the, uh, is that European University Press? No, it's Edinburgh University Edinburgh, Press. Edinburgh, sorry, I didn't, couldn't interpret no the problem. E. <laughs> and, and, and you are a co-editor of what is called the Shakespeare Seminar, which of course is something I don't know about, but you, maybe you can explain that to us. Um, you're, working, you. you're, work, <laughs> you're working on a project on early modern traveling ecologies that looks at material um, um, eco ecological and uh, epistemological relations between travel, writing, and, and the theater. This sounds so exciting. And for yes. us, you have decided to go to the 19th century and tell us something about uh, 19th century women who who uh, who traveled. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. I really look forward to the crocodile story. Thank you. Thank you I for the introduction. The floor is yours now. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. As you note, actually, or notice from this introduction, um, the 19th century is not actually my um, special field. I am interested in travel writing. I am interested in gender. So this is kind of where these two meet. And I really like um, these female travelers, especially the women writers um, of this period. Um, so I would like to talk about um, mostly Mary Kingsley, because that was the text that I've uploaded on Moodle. Um, so you have had a chance to read at least parts um, from her text. I will briefly also talk about Anna Leonowens and also about Isabella Bird Bishop. And um, the latter is particularly relevant right now because she is not her personally, but her fictional character in a play that is currently being performed at Freiburg. So I'll end actually with an advertisement for the Freiburg English um, Theatre um, Group. <laughs> Just so you know, I mostly finish, uh, focus actually on Mary Kingsley. Before I do that, I'd like to briefly um, go into... Oh, the PowerPoint doesn't move anymore. Doesn't? No. Ah, here we go. I'd like to briefly um, start by talking more generally about um, Victorian women travel writers and particularly about the topics um, that um, scholarship actually looks at when we talk about women travel writers of that period. And we will find many of the themes actually then in the in the text by these three um, women authors. Um, I won't always delve into each particular topic then when we analyze some text passages, but I um, you want you to have that kind of in your minds um, when we read some of their um, works actually. And some of the key themes that are being discussed currently actually in relation to 19th century travel writing, especially by women, are uh, the relationship between genre and gender. And we'll see that later on. How did women um, kind of enter this particular genre? Um, how did they develop that genre? And how is the relationship to gender? And you'll see in some of the excerpts that are brought also from scholarly um, studies um, that it was not always easy for um, at least some of the women to actually enter that genre and be taken as seriously or perhaps also occupy a bit of a different um, field than some of the men actually. Which is related to authorship, the question of how do they actually fill out that position of authors, what kind of roles in authorship were available to women at the time and also which ones did they actually um, develop themselves. And again, I brought you some quotes, some excerpts from articles and um, that delve into that. Then the third one is um, closely actually related to the fifth one. Um, when we talk about um, 19th century travel writing by women, 
most of the works went to parts of the world that were at one time or another also colonized by um, Great Britain, by the UK, which means that we always have to think about their writing um, from an intersectional point of view. So we have intersections of class um, and gender should also be in here, but I think that's clear um, because we're talking about travel writing by women, class and gender, um, class, gender and race and the power dynamics that we have here. And there was oftentimes an ambivalent relationship between these kind of dynamics um, when we talk about how did women actually um, portray themselves, how did they write about others, how did they write about themselves. Um, we see a lot of intersectional issues here and especially relationship between class, gender and race are actually important um, there. The question of Britishness also obviously plays into that and the question of how did women at that time um, uh, define themselves and their Britishness, how did they define it at home and how did they define it abroad and how does the one reflect upon the other and again we partly also see that in the works um, that we're reading today and then again the fifth one is closely linked to the third one and obviously also to the fourth one, um, empire and colonialism and a very ambivalent um, role that some of the women actually occupied because they um, were on the one hand also in a position of um, of being perhaps not marginalized or suppressed, but certainly not being in a in a power position always at home. When they went abroad, that was um, certainly um, sometimes different. So we see some of the ambiguities here of women traveling or traveling women. How do they um, participate in? different kinds of process of empire building and colonialism. And I brought you some um, excerpts from scholarly works. Those of you who are interested perhaps in reading up on them or also um, would like to use that for some of the essays. Um, one of the um, core themes actually that we see is um, authorship. And Sarah Mills has written um, a book about especially autobiographical um, travelogues, which is also then obviously related to the question of genre and gender. And um, she emphasizes that these travelogues, um, even though they're autobiographical, we can never, as we know in literary studies, um, we never do, not straightforwardly equate the author um, with the narrator. Um, and um, again, that is something that we know in literary studies, but Sarah Mills argues that it's especially important for women um, at the time because she says there were numerous restrictions on writings by women not only in the 19th century but um, especially also in the period that we're looking at her and um, she says that women particularly often compared to men experienced difficulties in writing and also in publishing their works so they did um, also write as all authors or as many authors do write for the market which means that that affected their choice of narrative the choice of the narrative persona also as we see in some of the excerpts later perhaps the use of irony the use of humor um, the kind of ambiguous relationship that some of these um, um, narratives have in the way that they tell the stories that they do tell also, some experiences may have been left out, others may have been emphasized more or overemphasized, perhaps others may have been, may have, um, been changed in order to make the works more publishable. Again, we know similar things from writing by men, especially also from um, travel writers, where also the uh, genre of um, autobiographical writing is not always obviously to be taken straightforward. But Mills argues that there are particular ways that women at the time had to accommodate actually um, that, um, that um, gap actually between the market and their own writing. So here's a quote from Mills in Discourses of Differences. She writes that one of the major problems in the analysis of women's travel writing is that of assuming that the texts are autobiographical and that they are straightforward transcriptions of the lives of the women travelers. When talking about the self in writing of any kind, their immediate problems, the self is presumed to be the writer self, which is translated into the persona or narrative voice in the text. But if we accept that the writer self in the first place is not a coherent entity, nor is it entirely under the control of the writer, then we cannot imagine that what we read in the text is a faithful representation of the writer. So she's warning us against here um, about reading the self as um, the autobiographical self. Again, that's something that we also know in other autobiographical genres, um, this idea of the contract between um, the reader and um, the author, this unwritten contract that readers always believe it to be true, that is not to be taken too seriously actually here or taken with a grain. We have to take that with a grain of salt here. 
And when we read some of the writings later on, especially by Mary Kingsley, um, we'll see um, that certainly. One of the books um, which for travel writing, for analyzing travel writing um, is um, really useful and also here informs some of my thinking at least about um, 19th century travel writing by women is the Handbook of Travel Writing edited by Barbara Schaff and Elizabeth A. Bowles has written one of the chapters particularly on gender. And um, she also focuses on the 19th century and says that in that period um, writing by women dramatically increased and there were a large number of women compared to previous uh, centuries at least when British women traveled abroad and she writes here both for personal and for professional reasons and she says that the new generation of women readers and also writers and it's this relationship between the female readers also and the writers that probably also informed some of the writing of the authors that we um, study here um, today. Um, she also writes that um, that was made possible by hard-won political legislation, new technologies, perhaps most of all the voracious appetite of the newly enlarged reading public. We know that um, the rise um, of the novel in the 18th century then also led obviously to the rise of the reading or a larger readership here. And the focus in the 19th century is actually very much also on women readers and on um, travel writing, which was one of the very popular genres of the time. Now that means also um, when we focus on women as travel writers that um, the conceptions of home actually were important because in the 19th century as um, most of you obviously know, um, women were oftentimes still very much associated with the home, with the home place, with the domestic sphere. Now, Elizabeth Bowles writes that when it comes to traveling or journeying, um, traveling abroad, actually, that means that women are actually taken out or take themselves out of that domestic space and they enter a very different space, which means that conceptions of home and belonging, but also of going abroad here, are um, particularly um, um, radically reconfined when it comes to travel writing, because it's not about the home anymore. It sometimes still reflects upon the home, but obviously it's about going abroad. Um, so she says that um, this conceptualization of home actually um, has to be rethought when it comes to travel writing. She writes that the third um, sentence here, home can denote a dwelling place um, or a domicile, the fixed residence of a family or household, but home can also designate a town, state or nation. Domestic can refer to either of these, a double meaning that takes on particular weight when we think about the relationship between gender and empire. So the question of how does uh, female travel writing actually reconfigure that domestic space? What happens when women go abroad? And in some of these writers, we notice, um, Anna Lee Nowens um, would be an example here, actually, that oftentimes the focus is also on domestic spaces in cultures abroad. In other cases, we don't see as much writing about the domestic spaces um, abroad. So in Isabella Bird or also in um, Mary Kingsley, um, there's not so much about the domestic spaces actually. We do have some obviously as well, but Anna Leonow is particularly known for writing about domestic spaces and then also actually entering spaces that male travel writers of the time were not always um, able to enter actually. Here we come to this intersectional idea of um, travel writing as um, by women as something that can always only be seen in relation to race, to class and to nation. Um, and although gender may seem to be the most distinctive category in the travel writing that we study here today, um, it is certainly also always influenced and um, interrelating with these other categories um, as well. She returns here again to this idea of the home and the domestic sphere. She says that the journey is often conceptualized in opposition to home as a point of origin and return, presided over by a wife and mother. But despite this ideological gendering of home as feminine and travel as masculine, women have always traveled. Um, the important thing is that in the 19th century, there was more travel writing by women. And also, again, when it comes to the 19th century, that many of these travels and many of these journeys, including including by women were related in one way or another to colonialism and empire building. Again, that's the last sentence here. Barbara Korte from, from Freiburg, uh, most of you know her obviously, has written um, a, 
a very famous book um, on uh, English travel writing, and she also emphasizes this intersectionality, saying that a separatist view of women's travel writing, which has been the aim of some orthodox feminist criticism, is in danger of ignoring general generic characteristics and developments and of reducing the travelers and the text to the typically feminine. And here she also argues actually that we have to see it in relationship to other categories and also in relationship to other discourses of 19th century writing. She writes that women thus travel not only as representatives of their gender, but also as members of their particular society and culture. And that is also how I would actually look at these authors here today. Some final quotes actually for, for this kind of more framework um, part, um, which I'd like to um, offer here in the beginning to help us think about these um, texts also from a theoretical perspective is again emphasis on home and how is that reconfigured in travel writing. Elizabeth Bowles write that if home is gendered feminine in the sense that it is presided over by a housewife or wife and mother, um, what does this symbolic structure imply for travelers who are not men? So again, by writing about traveling, by traveling themselves, there is already a reconceptual reconceptualization of um, the domestic sphere and especially the domestic sphere as um, it is so associated with women. So this idea here is that by having female travelers who write about their travels, there are new roles forged actually for women in the 19th century, roles that may have always been there for women, but that most women did not necessarily write about beforehand. So that is really something um, ongoing and fairly new for the 19th century. We know by now that there were also earlier travel writing by women, even in the early modern period. Um, that's one of the fields that's currently debated in early modernity, but still when it comes to um, uh, marketing and to actually popular travel works, then the 19th century was really key for women travel writers. For women then, Barbara Carter writes, like Isabella Bird and Mary Kingsley, travel provided an opportunity to cross the traditional gender boundaries of their own culture. So again, they used to be associated with domestic sphere, now with other spheres as well. However, the possibilities for escape and liberation in most cases were clearly limited. Traveling women were caught between the conventional expectations of their home societies and a counter discourse of emancipation. This frequently led to an awareness of gender ambiguity, and thus the travel accounts of these women fluctuate between a confident record of their achievements and an apparent anxiousness not to come across as masculine. And some of the strategies that we find in um, travel writing by women are, for instance, the use of humor, um, also the use of self-irony, also actually this um, kind of perhaps not writing about everything um, that they may have um, experienced, and also downplaying sometimes um, their own achievements a, a bit to make them seem to appear, as Barbara Corte here writes, not too masculine. Finally, the study of travel writing, um, Elizabeth Bowles writes, has been closely associated with the study of colonialism and empire, naturally so, at least for the 19th century. This is another area in which the impact of gender deserves scrutiny. In the course of the feminist recovery of women's travel writing, women's relationships to colonialism has been subject to debate. Earlier scholars frequently assumed that women travelers must be anti-imperialist and that the writings contest the colonial discourse of their day. However, things are much more complicated than that. And again, when we come later on to the examples, we see um, that many um, of the discourses that we find in the writings by Kingsley, Leon Owens and Isabella Bird also actually align with that, even if they are complicated as well by focusing on gender. Many women, Elizabeth Bowles writes, um, not surprisingly, were openly racist. She mentions one example here, which um, we don't have um, in our lecture here today, but she writes Janet Shaw is one example. Many supported and indeed materially contributed to the Imperial Project, including missionaries and philanthropists, as well as women like Maria Nugent, who traveled as the wives of colonial officials. So I would like us to be aware of these ambiguities and to be aware of the complexity. Many of these female travelers are really heroines and um, 
and also um, famous for what they did. Um, we know many of them also from um, kind of just cultural history. But I think when we study the literature, it's important um, to be able to see um, in the complex relationships, especially power relationships that they were in, but also the complexity actually of the genre um, itself. So with that, oh, sorry, no, there's one more slide. I think that should be the final um, slide here. Um, yes, that's also by um, um, uh, Philippa um, Levine here, Gender and Empire. She also argues that we need to see the complicated processes actually of gender and empire, that the two are actually um, not separate from each other, but that we have to keep in mind actually that they're different. She says here, group identif identifications always at work, the one group identification being gender, the other one also um, perhaps also being the nation or empire and so on. With that being said, I'd like to come to the first example. And you've already seen an image actually of her, a drawn image of Mary Kingsley, Mary Kingsley fighting with a crocodile, actually. That was my uh, opening um, slide here. I'm not sure if um, everyone is familiar with Mary Kingsley, so I'll briefly introduce her um, to you. You can read up on her biography, highly interesting biography, um, also obviously elsewhere, but at least to give you some sense of who Mary Kingsley was. She was a scientist, an explorer, and obviously a travel writer, and she inherited quite some money from her family. She had spent years um, caring for her family, and here we see um, this ambiguity of of at home being, first of all, associated with the domestic sphere, sphere but also having responsibilities towards the parents. Um, and um, she was, in a way, um, uh, in a very confined space at home. When her parents died, then she inherited the money, which brings in class here, obviously, um, as a category that was important. Otherwise, she could not have traveled. She couldn't have afforded to travel. She then, um, rather um, unusual for her time, decided to use this money to travel. She could have obviously done other things with that, but she decided to use it to travel. And her first trip was actually to Sierra Leone in 1893. And it was unusual because she traveled without a husband. Um, she actually traveled by herself, and that was um, highly unusual for the time. So she did leave that idea of the, she reconfigured that idea of the domestic actually for herself and became a, a solo female um, traveler. She returned to West Africa in 1894, and then she actually um, started to work as a scientist because she started to collect fish and also other natural objects for the British Museum, and she was in close um, in close touch, actually, with the British Museum, and she um, became a scientist who collected, actually, um, specimen for the British Museum. And there are some stories also about that, how she lost um, some of these uh, specimen and so on. But there was um, here an alignment actually of the scientific um, with um, or the scientific um, purpose of traveling, which was one of the one of the purpose also of traveling throughout the 19th century with also this idea of travel writing because she always wrote about her travels. Katharina Nambula has written a chapter on Mary Kingsley in the Handbook of British Travel Writing and delves into um, her biography and saying that actually it was after her parents' death when she had the financial means and the social freedom to travel that she actually did. She was almost 30 years old already, um, not kind of an old age, but still you see here that for 30 years she was confined to the domestic sphere at home. And only then actually she broke out of that and used her um, means, her financial means actually to realize her own ideas. Um, she um, actually uh, was in close touch with um, people in Africa and um, traveled with people in Africa. So she didn't always have um, other Europeans to travel with her. I'll delve into that a little bit later. She also writes about that and that was important for her. And um, she um, took different tours actually through Africa. The most 
two or the two most famous travel works that we have are Travels in West Africa from 1897 and West African Studies from 1899. So fairly um, written fairly close um, to each other. That was the time when Mary Kingsley traveled most actually. She um, um, travel, decided to travel to Africa, which was again quite unusual um, for her time because it was seen as a space that was highly um, uh, dangerous in terms of health and also highly unusual for women travelers, at least um, single women travelers um, to go there. It was um, uh, parts of it that were um, explored, parts of it um, that where she went to were not that well explored. So that was that was the time that were the spaces actually where she was um, rather unexpected as a female um, traveler. That being said, um, many women actually lauded her for that. She was praised um, in a way for uh, being a female um, explorer, um, similar to David Livingston and others. So she also became known actually as this um, female traveler um, leading the way to some parts at least of Africa. Those of you um, who are interested in African uh, travelers and tra African um, traveling from a European perspective, I brought you some maps actually, how images of Africa or ideas of Africa from a European, especially a British perspective changed throughout the 19th century. And you see here a map from the early 19th century and you see which parts of that had been explored um, by British or European travelers in the early 19th century. And then we see how that actually changed. Oh, and you see here, obviously the North is fairly well explored and then the coastal regions are fairly well explored. Um, we see that here rather well. And then we see as we go into the mid 19th century that again, it's the North, the coast, but then some interior parts of Africa are um, kind of the map is filling up. And again, obviously that's always a European perspective because um, from an African perspective, uh, perspective these um, um, spaces had already been filled before, but I think that's clear that it's always a Eurocentric um, idea that we have in these maps here. So we see that the southern part and also parts of the middle um, is being filled up in terms of mapping here. Oops, sorry. And then the next one is from 1880. And that's a bit earlier than um, Mary Kingsley uh, traveled, but you already see here, that was the time um, of the expeditions of David Livingston, for instance, um, also um, Richard Francis Burton and um, Henry Morton Stanley. And you see that so many parts have been filled up and so many parts of the interior of Africa have filled up just within these, what is it now, 75 um, years or so. You also see, however, that certain parts have not been filled yet. So these were the parts that were not so well explored from a European perspective, especially in the middle of um, Africa um, there. I thought I also brought bring you a map. Now that is obviously not um, Mary Kingsley. That is later. That's 1940. That's when um, Africa has been fully colonized um, by Europeans. So you also see actually here that these maps were being used for these purposes, especially after the Berlin Conference and um, and uh, then after World War One. Obviously, um, the map changed, but that is one of the purposes or one of the um, ways where we see how this mapping in the sense of exploration fully aligns with colonial purposes, not only British colonial purposes, you also see here actually um, France, you see Germany, Spain, Portugal, Italy and Belgium um, on this map of Africa once it has been colonized as well. Just I want to make sure that that's clear that mapping is not um, unideological in that sense here. Now let's come back to Mary Kingsley then. Um, Mary Kingsley was critical of some of the work being done by Europeans in Africa, and she was especially critical of missionary work. Um, she thought actually that it's not beneficial to African culture and African people to re-educate um, them. And um, she um, criticized actually missionaries openly. Despite that, actually, um, uh, Obviously, her work also, we'll see that later on, still aligns with discourses of Eurocentrism. Um, Europeans are always, in a way, um, uh, superior um, when it comes actually to comparisons of culture there. And we also see that she's um, sometimes quite critical, actually, of especially um, uh, sanitary and medical work in um, Africa. 
So she was a quite an um, emancipated woman. She did not almost surprisingly, perhaps, um, for us today, did not support um, um, the suffragette movement. Um, she said um, she herself thought that there were more pressing concerns um, for women um, at the time. Still, as a traveler um, and as an author, she certainly helped to um, to bring forward different ideas of um, what women could actually do um, in that time. I already mentioned the two most important works, Travels in West Africa and West African um, Studies, and I brought you some excerpts actually from Travels in West Africa to look at. Let's perhaps move on um, to these um, here. That's Travels in West Africa, widely available uh, work. I didn't check the different university libraries, but I'm very sure actually that it is available in all university libraries. And you have the first chapter of the text on Moodle. And it begins um, wonderfully. Um, I think I really like how she opens um, her work because it brings together some of these key ideas or key themes, key issues in travel writing um, by women in the 19th century. She writes that it was in 1893 that for the first time in my life, I find, found myself in possession of five or six months which were not heavily forestalled and feeling like a boy with a new half crown. I lay about in my mind, as Mr. Bunyan would say, as to what to do with them. Go and learn your tropics, said science. Where on earth am I to go, I wondered, for tropics are tropics wherever found. So I got down an atlas and saw that either South America or West Africa must be my destination, for the Malayan region was too far off and too expensive. My ignorance regarding West Africa was soon removed, and although the vast cavity in my mind that it occupied is not even half filled up, there's a great deal of very curious information in its place. Again, I really like this opening. I think it's wonderful how she, um, uh, on the one hand, explains um, her purpose and um, kind of opens up uh, or serves as an exposition to what comes later. But it also brings out several of these ambiguities, actually, that we discussed earlier, which we see here. So it says that beforehand, she actually did not have the time to do that and did not have the means to do that. She says that it was for the first time in my life, I found myself in possession of five or six months, which were not heavily forestalled. Meaning that beforehand, she did not have that time. She did not have that space available. Available. She was confined actually to the domestic space and she doesn't blame anybody here. She doesn't talk about kind of gender roles, but it is clear because we know her biography. It is clear actually that was that was because she had to take care um, of um, her parents. She was a caretaker beforehand. And then she brings out that uh, gendering. She says, and feeling like a boy with a new half crown. So here she brings out that freedom that she, in that case, actually associates um, with masculinity, with a boy, a boy with a new half crown, so also bringing in this idea of financial needs. Um, then she says, uh, go and learn your tropics, said science. And then we already have this idea that science would actually interest her. And then she brings in um, the or she plays, I think, with this idea of being ignorant. Um, where on earth am I to go, I wondered. For tropics are tropics were ever found. And so I got down an atlas um, and saw that either South America or West Africa must be my destination. Now, I don't know exactly, obviously, I wasn't there with her, but I'm pretty sure that Mary Kingsley knew beforehand where the tropics were and that she was well educated enough to know that beforehand. So we get a sense here of downplaying her own status, downplaying perhaps also her own education in order perhaps to um, play a more feminine role here and not actually bringing out the entire knowledge that she has from the beginning um, already. Again, we see that in the second um, sentence or the uh, pre -ultimate sen in the ultimate sentence here, and all the vast cavity in my mind that it occupied is not even half filled up. So almost emphasizing actually this um, idea that she does not have all the knowledge yet. Um, so here we see that uh, that um, what Barbara Corte and others have written, that in a way women downplayed sometimes their own roles here in order perhaps to make it more suitable for the reading public for the market. 
Mary Kingsley then goes on, says, I will not go into the details of the voyage here, much as I'm given to discursiveness, again, emphasizing almost this role of women as uh, liking um, actually to talk and like to be discursive. She says, they're more amusing than instructive. For on my first voyage out, I did not know the coast and the coast did not know me. And we mutually terrified each other. Again, playing perhaps here with this idea of the female traveler as someone who might also be a uh, terrifying, not perhaps um, being as masculine and um, not as um, as heroic, perhaps even as some of the other travelers here. But again, I think she plays with that stereotype um, as well. I fully expected to get killed by the local nobility and gentry. They thought I was connected with the World's Women's Temperance Association and collecting shocking details for subsequent magic lantern lectures on the liquid traffic. So fearful misunderstandings arose, but we gradually ed educated each other and I had the best of the affair. For all I had got to teach them was that I was only a beetle and fetish hunter and so forth, while they had to teach me a new world and a very fascinating course of study. I found it. Here she's actually talking about her fellow travelers and how she almost inherits a different class than they do, but also how they thought that her as a single traveler, solo traveler, female traveler, um, they expected something entirely different of her and not actually be a beetle and fetish hunter. And again, she also downplays that a bit here. I only had to teach them that I was a, be a beetle and fetish hunter and so forth. Right. So even though her um, her purpose was to go and collect um, specimen for the British Museum, um, she downplays that here and doesn't say I was a scientist and I went out there in the world in order actually to do that. Um, she kind of says, well, that's the only thing I want to do. And she wants to uh, uh, downplay her part here, at least um, a bit. Still, um, we see this downplaying, we see this ambiguity of the role here as a female traveler, a female travel writer. She still emerges as quite a strong, unusual 19th century um, traveler. We find irony very frequently. Um, we saw some of that um, earlier. Um, again, that allows for a certain kind of subversion of traditional um, gender roles, but also, as we just saw, when it comes to perhaps making herself um, seem a bit humorous, actually, it also partakes actually in this stereotypical gender role of the women not being quite perhaps as knowledgeable, not being perhaps quite as heroic um, and so on. So we see how gender always intersects here um, with class, but also with race. And we see some of these um, examples actually um, later on. I skip that a quote for now. It um, it's interesting to see what uh, Mary Kingsley does when she writes about um, the genre that she is writing in. Namely, um, she calls it um, my diary here, but she also obviously writes a longer um, travel travelogue. She writes, I must pause here to explain my reasons for giving extracts from my diary, being informed an excellent authority that publishing a diary is a form of literary crime. And here she plays with this idea of um, autobiography, um, perhaps being uh, not um, the most renowned genre, obviously, especially for a woman. Such being the case, I have to urge in extenuation of my committing it that Firstly, I have not done it before, for so far I have given a sketchy resume of many diaries kept by me while visiting the regions I have attempted to describe. Secondly, no one expects literature in a book of travel. And thirdly, there are things to be said in favor of the diary form, particularly when it is kept in a little known and wild region. For the reader gets there in notice of things that, although unimportant in themselves, yet go to make up the conditions of life under which men and things exist. My favorite part from this is the second, no one expects literature in a book of travel, um, which is uh, wonderful for someone who really likes travel writing. Um, I do think it is literature, but again, she downplays the expectations here of the reader. And she says it doesn't have to be high literature. It doesn't have to be, uh, you don't have to expect anything um, from that. But obviously, we do get a lot from her. Um, one other thing I'd like to go into, actually, is um, this idea of Africa, especially at that time, um, being a 
um, a place that was associated um, very much with illness and with death, which is understandable from a European um, position because many people were exposed, obviously, as we now know, um, to different uh, viruses, different form of bacteria, which they didn't know from Europe. So many Europeans actually got quite ill. Many Europeans did die when they went to Canada. Uh, sorry, not to Canada, to um, Africa. It is also a certain sense here of um, bringing out the heroic nature of the travel, but obviously it's also a very Eurocentric perspective on Africa because it was not Africa, obviously, that was um, in and of itself um, associated with illness. It was only Europeans traveling somewhere for the first time that uh, then actually they got ill. Mary Kingsley reflects on this and reflects on why she actually travels to what others have called the deadliest spot on earth. She writes that I inquired of all my friends at the beginning what they knew of West Africa. The majority knew nothing. A percentage said, oh, you can't possibly go there. That's where Sierra Leone, Leone is, the white man's grave, you know. No, there was no doubt about it. The place was not healthy, and although I had not been a sad trial, yet neither had the chandelier dislodging Fernando Poo gentleman. So I next turned my attention to cross-examining the doctors. Deadliest spot on earth, they said cheerfully, and showed me maps of the geographical distribution of disease. I wouldn't go there if I were you, said my medical friends. You'd catch something. But if you must go and you're as obstinate as a mule, just bring me and then follow the list of commissions from here to New York, any one of which, but I only found that out afterwards. All my informants referred me to the missionaries. There were, they said, in an airy way, lots of them down there and had been for years. So to missionary literature, I addressed myself with great ardor. Alas, only to find that these good people wrote their reports not to tell you how the country they resided in was, but how it was getting on towards being what it ought to be. I also found fearful confirmation of my medical friend's statements about its unhealthiness and various details of the distribution of cotton shirts, over which I did not linger. So associations here of Africa with illness, especially also with death from a European perspective, are quite prominent here. Again, nowadays we know or we have different medical um, explanations um, for that. We find the same thing when um, people travel to Europe for the first time um, and so on. And we also here get this criticism that Mary Kingsley has in her work of the missionaries. She says that these good people did not write reports to tell you how the country they reside in was, but how it should be actually. And she criticized this idea to always change and re-educate um, Africans. She didn't like that and she wasn't on good terms actually with the missionaries. Um, this is just a quotation, actually, um, from a book on disease and empire, which also emphasized that, that it was a matter, actually, of uh, first contact between Europeans and other kinds of illnesses, yellow fever, uh, malaria, also um, certain other um, gastrointestinal um, infections, that it was a clear medical explanation of why that was the case still from a European point of view. Um, Africa and especially West Africa was seen actually as a quite um, deadly um, spot um, actually. Now what Mary Kingsley did um, rather than relying on these European advice only and, and European um, ideas about um, Africa, she actually relied as Katharina Nambula writes on the company of West Africans and she traveled without Western male companions and again quite unusual for her time. It was one of the reasons also why she got different insights actually into African society than other people actually did. Kingsley Nambula writes was an outstanding explorer given her unusual method of approach, her intelligence, her confidence, her strong will. She changed the view on African exploration. She turned field work into an acceptable scientific method and stood out as an example for female strength and ability that went far beyond the Victorian ideal. So we see here how travel writing actually changes and reflects not only here in this case on Africa, but that how, how it also reflects on Victorian ideals of gender and um, Victorian gender norms, because um, as Nabula here rights, um, it went far beyond these Victorian um, ideals actually here.
Mary Kingsley again, she writes that um, one of the humorous passages here, I have great reason to be grateful to the Africans themselves, to cultured men and women like, and among them like Charles Wu, Bo, Sangha Klaas, Jane Harrington and her sister at Gaboon, and to the Bush natives. But of my experience with them, I give further details, so I need not dwell on them here. I apologize to the general reader for giving so much detail on matters that really only affect myself. And I know that the indebtedness which all African travelers have to the white residents in Africa is a matter usually very lightly touched on. No doubt my voyage would seem a grander thing if I omitted mention of the help I received. But, well, there was a German gentleman once he evolved a camel out of his business. So she says here that um, no one is able to travel actually without the help of um, Africans, uh, without the help of African travelers. Only by omitting it, some people make it sound as if they did not rely actually on the help here. But she emphasizes actually the help that she got and in that way, um, perhaps also brings in um, um, a principle of cooperation, even though again, there's always a power hierarchy here. So it's um, difficult to say, um, Oh, it's difficult for us to see actually what this relationship really was like, um, but for her it's important actually to mention people, um, to name them, um, not so much to give a voice to them, but certainly to bring in their names and their stories um, here in this um, passage and in other passages from her travel writing as well. Emphasis on the humorous style here. Um, one last thing I would like to mention about Mary Kingsley is that although um, we find her being highly self-reflective, also being very critical, um, Blanton Casey writes that the popular press was especially unkind to her. And there were numerous cartoons of her, um, which actually made fun because of um, some of the uh, more adventurous things um, that she did, such as fighting with the crocodile. And there were actually cartoons which um, played into Victorian ideals, stereotypes um, of women, and linked that actually to their role as travelers. So, for instance, um, we have them precariously on a camel or a canoe, sandwiched in between groups of natives, looking ridiculously out of place in their dresses and bonnets. This kind of treatment in popular um, cartoons or in, in the press more generally trivialized their efforts and was largely responsible for them being seen as freaks. And that is also so what we get in some of these images actually that we have of uh, Mary Kingsley, um, they, as you see here, do look highly out of place, um, whether or not they're freaks here, um, that's um, um, a question, but you see that in a way there's almost um, oh, this ambiguity of the, the Victorian travel writer that I think comes out most or perfectly in these images. On the one hand, they're meant to represent a Victorian ideal of uh, femininity and on the other hand they also try to um to forge new roles for women um, at the time and there's not always an ideal solution to that but when we read their travel writing we do see actually the difficulties um, that they faced in trying to bring these two different spheres um, together uh, something that could not always be done easily and not perfectly in their writing um but we yeah, again, I think we see the larger what um, the, the complexities or also the ambivalences that women writers, especially travelers, faced throughout the 19th century. With that, I would like to, um, oh yes, just perhaps to mention that um, she became famous, Mary, uh, Mary Kingsley became famous, she toured, actually she gave lectures um, on um, Africa, actually she also became political, she advocated for less imperial um, interference in African culture and um, customs, so, so she became actually quite a political person um, as well after her return then to England. With that, I would like us to turn to the next um, female travel writer, Anna Leonowens, and um, she traveled to a very different part um, of the world. And again, I would like to briefly introduce her at least, and then um, give um, offer you some excerpts from her travel writing. That is not on Moodle, so what you have on Moodle is um, Mary Kingsley, but I brought you some um, examples, some passages also from Anna Leonowens.
Now, for Anna Leah Nowens, it's not so easy to give her biography because there are two different versions of her biography. The version one is the one that is told by Anna Leah Nowens herself. And she says that she was born as Anna Harriet Emma Crawford in Wales in 1834. Her father was Captain Thomas Crawford and he transferred to India in 1840. That is also why she then actually also lived in India for some time. Her father then actually died. Her mother remarried a British official in India. Um, she herself went to school in Wales, but then also um, joined them, then went back to Wales um, again. So she she does have a part Indian upbringing, but mostly actually a Welsh upbringing and schooling. And that is what she said about herself in her writing. Later biographers have questioned this version of Anna Leonowen's biography and have argued, and especially Leslie Smith Dow has written that, a Canadian critic, that she was not born actually in uh, the UK, but she, that she was born in India. And her father did work for the East India uh, Company, actually, but that her mother may have been an Indian woman. And um, there has been quite some debate, actually, about this version of her biography, because it accuses Anna Leonowens of having lied about her biography. And um, Leslie Smith Dow says um, there's good reason, actually, um, to argue for this version of her biography. First of all, there are no records of her schooling in Wales. She had no contact with her family um, throughout um, adult life. And also, he even argues that um, her uh, skin color and her kind of um, outer looks actually align her more um, with an Indian or part um, Indian heritage, actually. Um, I'm not uh, the judge on that. I'm also not an expert actually on her biography. The one thing that um, I think it's interesting because we see that throughout um, criticism that we find of Anna Leah Nowen's works is that it's oftentimes a matter of truth or fiction and that many later authors actually have criticized Anna Leah Nowen's for not telling the truth. And that is both the case about her biography, but also about some of the things actually um, she writes in her travel writing. So she has been accused for not being factual, for not being scientific enough, for not being in a way up on the level that especially male writers were at the time. And that has been a common criticism. And later on, you also see some of the work has been turned into fiction, and that has been highly popular. But when it comes to travel writing, um, the um, parameters that she has been um, criticized for actually are mostly about factuality and not telling the truth, even when it comes to her own biography. I leave that standing as it is. Again, I'm not the one um, to judge here. What we do know is that later on she has married. Her husband died. Um, she married um, Thomas Leon Owens, changed that to Leon Owens. And she had two young children to support. Um, and she actually um, started to teach um, then in order to support her young um, family. And then she went actually to um, Siam as um, a governess in order to teach actually at the um, Siamese court. Um, and um, that is also then what her travel writing um, is mostly about actually. Um, she published that um, as a memoir, first in the Atlantic Monthly as a, in a journal, but later on also actually in a book called um, uh, the English governors at the Siamese court, recollections of six years in the royal palace at Bangkok. And she emphasizes this, what we call the truth condition. In the beginning of her writing, in the beginning, in the opening, she says, in the following pages, I had try have tried to give a full and faithful account of these scenes and the characters that were gradually unfolded to me as I began to understand the language and by all other means to attain a clearer insight into the secret life of the court. I was thankful to find, even in the citadel of Buddhism, men and above all women who were lovely in their lives, who amid infinite difficulties in the bosom, bosom of a most corrupt society and enslaved to capricious and often cruel will, yet devoted themselves to an earnest search after truth. Again, this idea of factuality, of truth, something that we know from autobiographical writing, the eyewitness account, and so on, that is emphasized here, the full and faithful account, also the search after truth. You also already see quite, um, 
quite a, a discourse here of Europeans are the ones actually um, who tell the truth um, and she criticizes actually um, that um, there's a corrupt society uh, abroad. She also emphasize, empathizes with the people say then that amid infinite difficulties, they actually also try um, to do the right thing. And she emphasized the enslavement of people abroad in the Atlantic Monthly, which I said earlier was the first place of publication of a memoir. Um, there's been quite some publications actually on slavery and especially the anti-slavery movement in the 19th century. So that may actually align here also with the um, journal in which she first published this. So truth here is a governing principle of the narrative. Um, Leonor Wins presents herself as a proponent of the truth and of objectivity um, that intersects with religious and also with cultural narratives of truthfulness. Um, for instance, here the reference to Buddhism, also the cultural corruption and so on. So as a narrator here, she um, tries to uh, tries to turn um, the objectivity of her account into a mediating device, saying that that is what I would like to convey to you, the truth actually of that world. I mentioned earlier that she particularly often also gives insight into the female worlds actually at the um, Siamese court, um, for instance, talking about um, um, other women, about the wives of the king. These are domestic spheres years abroad that a male travel writer at the time would not have had access to. So that is, this is again, later critics have um, blamed her for not always um, telling the truth. Um, but that is, I think, more of a, um, a gender bias here also in the reception of her work. She writes then, again, here we see emphasis on slavery, um, so aligning that with the slavery um, and um, the entire debate also about the Atlantic, because that's where she first published uh, her writing. She writes that I had never beheld misery till I found it here. I had never looked upon the sickening hideousness of slavery till I encountered the perfection of the life, light, blessedness and beauty, the all sufficing fullness of the love of God as it is in Jesus, until I felt the contrast here pain, deformity, darkness, death, and eternal emptiness, a darkness to which there is neither beginning nor end, a living which is neither of this world nor of the next. The misery which checks the pulse and thrills the heart with pity in one's common walks about the great cities of Europe is hardly so saddening as the nameless, mocking wretchedness of these women, to whom poverty were luxury and houselessness as a draught of pure, free air. So quite a gender discourse here. Again, obviously Eurocentric perspective, Eurocentric perspective, Eurocentric perspective here on um, uh, women actually who are not Christians, um, who are not um, um, emancipated in the sense that Anna Lee at least thought that she is emancipated. She emphasizes also when she talks to women actually at the court that she is supporting herself, that she is earning her own money, whereas um, they are not. So we have the gender discourse here of emancipation, of being a from a European perspective, at least um, quite a strong female character. But she always contrasts this actually with women um, at the Siamese court and says that they are not as advanced, they are not as emancipated. So quite an ambivalent discourse actually here when it comes to um, feminism, right? Here, that's one uh, excerpt here when she tells the women, I am not like you. You have nothing to do but to play and sing and dance for your master. I have to work for my children. And one little one is on the great ocean. I'm very sad. Um, so that is where we see here that it might be feminist from one point of view, but it's certainly not this idea of feminism um, of as an intersectional category um, that we uh, like actually or should um, take. Here it's quite a, a, a divide between European and non-European forms of femininity. Um, 
There is a reproduction then here of colonial discourses. Um, Karen um, Kaplan writes in Getting to Know You actually that um, there is a supposedly post-colonial moment here, but actually what we see is that she reproduces this idea of a Eurocentric um, person or a person being a Eurocentric discourse of a European person actually being superior to the people that they um, encounter here, especially other women. Um, she um, writes especially about, um, again, domestic spaces um, at the Siamese court here. Um, she also writes about her own boy, so we um, have him as a witness as well. She's a witness, actually, to what happens at the court, but also she brings in her own um, son here. And um, I'll skip that passage for now. And then she portrays the king in a way that has been criticized later on um, quite a lot. Um, she writes that when once the king was enraged, there was nothing to be done but to wait in patience until the storm should exhaust itself by its own fury. Sounds a bit like King Lear um, to me here. So perhaps also something that we know in European um, traditions. But here she emphasized actually that it's linked to um, the patriarchal court cultures um, at the CME's court. But it was horrible to witness such an abuse of power at the hands of one who was the only source of justice in the land. It was a crime against all humanity, the outrage of the strong upon the helpless. His madness sometimes lasted um, a week. That is her portrayal here. And again, we see how she is trying actually to bring forth a um, perhaps not democratic, but certainly a, a, a discourse or a, an argument here against this abuse of power. We also see that it's quite a stereotypical portrayal here of um, uh, a king, a non-European king, actually, who might abuse that power. That is the discourse that has then later on be be received in popular culture. Um, some of you might know um, the film or musical The King and I, which is based actually on Anna Leonowen's um, writing. Now, there has been quite a medial or a transmedia reception of Anna Leonowen's work. Um, the memoir itself was criticized quite a lot, but then that was turned into fiction. And there's a novel in between that, and that novel was then turned into a musical, and that musical was then turned into um, a film. And again, the one that's perhaps most popular is The King and I from 1956. Starring actually um, Deborah Kerr and Yul um, Brynner, and that is based on the novel, but actually on Margaret Landon's novel, which is a rewriting of um, Anna Leo Nowen's um, work here. And here you see this um, stereotypical portrayal actually of the king, King Monkut, actually from um, what is now um, Thailand, um, where he is also portrayed as a cruel king, of someone who is then civilized by the Victorian um, ladies. So by Anna um, Leonowens um, here. Again, that was criticized um, for um, the portrayal actually of um, the king here. And here we have this colonial discourse um, once um, again. The film had been um, made. It was criticized by especially viewers in um, Siam, the um, novel that had been written actually based on Leonowen's work was banished in um, um, Siam because they criticized the portrayal of the king here. We do see that even today such um, representations of um, intercultural encounters, not always highly successful ones here, um, that the truth condition is different um, from a European perspective. It's a different than obviously from a non-European um, perspective. There was uh, an attempt actually to remake that film in 19. 98, um, but um, even then Thailand actually refused that that should be filmed in Thailand simply because it's still such a, um, a controversy in Thailand and um, people refused actually to have another um, remake of that movie because they still disliked uh, the representation of the king here. So from for Leonowens then, um, what we see is that her original work was not as popular when it comes to um, to scientific representations of truth. It became highly popular when it refers to the domestic sphere because in the film, 
uh, go back one slide. In that film here, there's obviously a love story involved, as you might see from this slide. There's a love story involved between Anna Leonowens and the king, something that was never actually the case in the original um, memoir. There was no love story. She actually left the court then um, later on and went to Canada. But in the popular um, reception of her travel writing, that was the focus. It was only the love story actually that turned into the focus. And you also see in that image here a quite um, stereotypical portrayal actually of a British uh, woman here. So perhaps that's one thing that we can see here, how in popular culture, um, travel writing becomes highly successful, but only when it focuses on the domestic sphere and also, again, on stereotypical representations of women, not so much when it comes to um, kind of telling more scientific or uh, informing on more scientific um, facts, actually. Again, another um, image here and then final quote perhaps where we see a non-European um, uh, perspective actually on in this case the film not Leonowen's travel work um, there's a quote here from um, someone who had seen the film or actually an image of the film in 1958 from Prajua Tira Bhutana, who wrote about encountering images um, of the film, said, I had never seen the picture, the king and I, but I saw some pictures in a magazine. And the attitude of the Thai king in those pictures made my ears burn hot. It was just the pictures. Everyone knew that. So why should Thai people pay much attention to it? And it was through these pictures that people all over the world would know Thailand. Of course, they would know and remember the name of our country well, because they had to laugh at the queer and wild actions of their king. But the question was, where did the man who told the actor to act that way get those manners from? We partly know, after the quotation that I um, showed you earlier, partly from Anna Leonowens, but partly also obviously from stereotypes and from other depictions actually of Thai culture, which were not always based on Anna Leonowens work herself. So again, we see how um, colonial discourses here intersect not only with uh, gender, but certainly also with the gender role, because Anna Leonowens herself is then portrayed as the perfect British lady actually, who's able to tame the king, at least that is in the king and I, not in the Nomad's work herself. I move on to my last and shortest examples, and then we can stop there and open the floor for questions. That's Isabella Bird Bishop, um, someone who, again, might be known to some of you, especially those of you who've already seen Top Girl, um, might remember some of her famous actually um, uh, travels um, through her work. You see an image here of um, Isabella Bird Bishop, who was also obviously a British traveler, travel writer. Um, she was also a natural scientist, a photographer as well. And um, she is known a bit similar to Mary Kingsley as someone who was very confined when she was at home. In this case, not because she had to um, care for her parents, but because she suffered from ill health um, from early childhood on. And um, there's a saying that um, at home um, she was an invalid and abroad actually only she became the famous heroic um, and quite healthy traveler actually that she then um, was. Again, something some of you might remember from Top Girl. She received no formal education. Um, her father instructed her in botany and uh, she was an avid reader from an early age on. And interesting enough, traveling was recommended to her um, by the doctors to improve her health. We know similar um, biographies actually. Um, um, Robert Louis Stevenson comes to mind, also someone who was um, actually um, recommended to travel for health reasons. In this case, for Isabella Bird Bishop, um, they first traveled actually um, to other parts of the UK and then also to Europe. She then later on traveled to Australia, to Hawaii, to North America, and also to Asia. So she didn't necessarily then follow doctor's recommendations that later on for her health, um, she traveled where she uh, wanted um, to go. Stephen Clark um, writes that um, 
that's the famous saying, um, I already partly quoted it. Um, she has been described as the invalid home, but Samson abroad. Her illness appears to epitomize the infantilizing of women by the constraints of Victorian domestic ideology and the potential liberation offered by the simple act of traveling. The counterposition has been argued that her viewpoint advances an evangelical and free trade agenda deeply complicit with imperial expansion. Again, we have this ambiguity in here and we won't be able to resolve that. Women who traveled, um, at least from a European perspective, try to liberate themselves from a non-European perspective. They were obviously also part of the empire and of empire building. I brought you a few excerpts only from um, her publication um, about Japan called Unbeaten Tracks in Japan. I thought this way we have quite a, a range actually of um, uh, geographical spaces um, in here. And I won't go into um, depth for all of them, just again, similar to the earlier passages, point out a few things um, here and there. And I also brought you some images again um, from Isabella Bird's own travel writing. She writes um, quite beautifully, actually, about um, the city of Tokyo. She writes that 18 days of unintermitted rolling over desolate rainy seas brought the city of Tokyo early yesterday morning to Cape King. And by noon, we were steaming up the Gulf of Yedo, quite near the shore. The day was soft and gray with a little faint blue sky. And though the coast of Japan is much more prepossessing than most coasts, there were no startling surprises either of color or form. Broken wooded ridges, deeply cleft rise from the water's edge, gray, deep roofed villages cluster about the mouth of the ravines and terraces of rice cultivation, bright with the greenness of English lawns, run up to a great height among dark masses of upland forests. The populousness of the coast is very impressive and the gulf everywhere was equally peopled with fishing boats of which we passed not only hundreds but thousands in five hours. There's a beautiful focus here on nature, on landscape, um, obviously. Um, there's almost the sense of the sublime here, something that we obviously also know from European, especially also Scottish um, travel writing. But she here describes this grandness, actually, the grandeur um, of the Japanese um, landscape, brings in the terraces of rice cultivation, bright with the greenness of English lawns. I love that how she compares that. She always brings that in to perhaps also to activate their, her readers' imagination, that they might be able to, um, to imagine this kind of um, lushness, perhaps, of the Japanese um, countryside. But then you also have the great height among dark masses of upland forest. So again, a sense of nature as a sublime, um, uh, as a sublime um, landscape here. For long I lo looked in vain for Fujitsan and failed to see it, though I heard ecstasies all over the deck, till, accidentally, looking heavenwards instead of earthwards, I saw far above any possibility of height, as one would have thought, a huge, truncated cone of pure snow, 13,000 feet above the sea, from which it sweeps upwards in a glorious curve, very when against a very pale blue sky, with its base and the intervening country veiled in a pale gray mist. It was a wonderful vision, and shortly as a vision vanished. Except the cone of Tristan da Cunha, also a cone of snow, I never saw a mountain rise in such lonely majesty, with nothing near or far to detract from its height and grandeur. No wonder that it is a sacred mountain and so dear to the Japanese that their art is never weary of representing it. It was nearly 50 miles off when we first saw it. Very reminiscent here of um, travel writing about mountains, which is prominent in Europe, um, but also um, in the UK itself in the um, 18th and especially 19th century. I mentioned already this idea of the sublime here. We find similar descriptions actually of the Alps, for instance, um, in Europe, the sense of the grandeur, the vision actually. On the one hand, um, there's a, uh, a beauty there, but there's also almost um, uh, a fear or perhaps a terror actually of that grand grandness of um, nature actually in here. And you have an image actually in Isabella Bird's own travel writing um, where she 
uh, portrays um, the mountains actually here. Oops, sorry. Now, apart from these nature and landscape images, um, she writes a lot about um, the practicalities, um, what people actually use in Japan, um, how they actually um, go uh, about in terms of everyday life. One of um, the um, things that she describes actually here are the man cards, and I thought I'd give you um, a short uh, uh, description of those and also there's an image in her uh, writing of it. As I look out of the window I see heavy two-wheeled man carts drawn and pushed by four men each on which nearly all goods, stones for buildings and all else are carried. The two men who pull press with hands and thighs against a crossbar at the end of the heavy pole and the two who push apply their shoulders to beams which project behind using their thick smoothly shaven skulls as the motif um, power when they push the heavy loads uphill. Their cry is impressive and melancholy. They draw incredible loads, but as if the toil, which often makes every breath a groan or a gasp, were not enough, they shout incessantly with a coarse, guttural grunt, something like, and I won't attempt to read that because I'm sure I couldn't um, pronounce it. Emphasis here on the bodies, emphasis actually on the bodily strength and also on the bodily work um, that is done um, in Japan. We know something similar, obviously, in descriptions of Africa, but also other perhaps not yet industrialized cultures. So that is something where we see where Europeans actually bring in their own experiences um, in um, uh, Great Britain. Obviously, um, you would have used um, horses or other means by that time actually to carry and transport um, things. She writes a lot about um, uh, about religion, uh, about temples, and also brings in a certain um, uh, um, uh, a veneration here, but also a certain sense, obviously, of being estranged um, from that culture. So perhaps one final um, description here, when she starts to um, convey the sense of um, of uh, Buddhism actually to European readers. She writes that along the paved avenue, beside, beside the usual stone um, trough for holy water, there are on one side the thousand armed Kwan Non, a very fine relief, and on the other a Buddha throned on the internal lotus blossom with an iron staff, much resembling a crozier in his hand, and that eternal apathy on his face, which is the highest hope of those who hope at all. I went through a wood where there are some mournful groups of graves on the hillside, and from the temple came the sweet sound of the great bronze bell and the beat of the big drum, and then, more faintly, the sound of the little bell and drum with which the priest accompanies his ceaseless repetition of a phrase in the dead tongue of a distant land. There's an infinite pathos about the lonely temple in its splendor, the absence of even possible worshippers, and the large populations of Ainos sunk in yet deeper superstitions than those which go to make a popular Buddhism. Again, we see here how she tries to bring across actually um, what um, the culture, what it is like. And um, we get the sound, actually, the description of sounds here. We also get this idea of um, the temple and earlier saw the images um, as well, quite be beautiful. We also get this sense of that um, Isabel Bellabert herself is estranged um, from that. Um, we get this idea that there's an eternal apathy on his face, which the highest hope of those who hope at all, so something that is not known um, to um, her or Christian culture more generally. We also get this idea of a dead tongue of a distant um, land here. Um, so there's something that obviously is uh, not a familiar religious um, culture to Europeans, including Isabella Bird um, here. Then we have a poem, actually, which is where I would like to end um, quoting from Isabella Bird's own work. Said, I sat on a rock by the bay till the last pink glow faded from Usutaki and the last lemon stain from the still water and a beautiful crescent which hung over the wooded hill had set and the heavens blazed with stars. Ten thousand stars were in the sky, ten thousand in the sea. And every wave with dimpled face that leapt upon the air had caught a star in its embrace and held it trembling there. 
there are these moments of beauty, the moments of um, splendor and also of reflection here, um, also of self-reflection in Isabella Bird's uh, writing. Again, highly interesting for numerous reasons. I hope I caught your interest also in the literary uh, factor of these writings, even though Mary Kingsley had written that no one expects literature in a travel work. That's where I would like to end, but not without actually advertising for a production of Top Girls, which is currently run at uh, the University of Freiburg from the English Theatre Group, Maniacs um, there. I do include the link here to their website. And I include that because Top Girls is a play by Carol Churchill, but it includes a fictional version of Isabella Bird. And um, there are, uh, is a wonderful performance actually of Isabella um, Bird. There are also numerous other um, female characters, famous female characters from um, centuries, actually, um, of world history. And in this particular image, you see Isabella Bird as a Victorian traveler. And that is from the production. Thank you to um, the maniacs for allowing me to show these images. Here you see in the center, actually, an image of Isabella Bird as being performed in the current um, performance of Top Girls at Freiburg University. It's still running on Friday, Saturday and Sunday this week. So if anybody hasn't been and if anybody is interested in Isabella Bird, I highly recommend this production. I've seen it and I uh, loved it actually. Not only Isabella Bird, but also the performance of Isabella Bird. With that, I end my lecture. We still have some time for questions if there are any. If not, um, then we can uh, have an early evening off here, but um, the floor is open, obviously, if there are questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Kirsten. That was, that was interesting. We got lots of fascinating information. That's really nice. Um, thank you for that talk. I'm, I'm, I'm always... Um, so overwhelmed and delighted, you know, that we have uh, all of these guest speakers and somehow everybody's a guest speaker in this this lecture cycle um, who contributes such interesting new perspectives. This is absolutely lovely. Thank you. Terrific. And I've seen a couple of hands there clapping. And I may have seen some hands also trying to ask questions, which is also good. There was a hand up there somewhere. Jennifer hand. I saw Jennifer's hand. Can you ask? Yeah, this this might be a sort of silly question, but um, I grew up reading uh, uh, the. Uh, it's her first name is Anna. I remember that. <laughs> um, I grew up reading the the actual story that she wrote, um, mm -hmm. and then watching Anna and the King as well as the King and I. Mm. And uh, I don't think you talk too much about Anna and the King because I think it's it's the non musical version of it. But I do wonder if if there are any writers and any critics who are in like, developing uh, this this like maybe alternate storyline or possible storyline of Anna being a possibly woman of Indian descent. Because I feel mm. like if she had leaned into that, which I'm sure she couldn't have done at the time, that would have really changed what that narrative, that travel writing narrative could have done. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if there was anything that you came across um, about people talking about how that would have changed your narrative and if there's anything in the works. <laughs> Great question. Thank you so much. Hi, Jennifer, by the way. <laughs> Nice to see you. Um, great question. I have not come across anything, um, which I think is telling in and of itself, um, because the narrative that she was, or the criticism actually, and it's oftentimes brought as a criticism against her, um, that she was not a truthful writer, she did not tell even her family the truth, and so on. And it's almost um, pointed as a criticism of her as both a travel writer and an autobiographical uh, writer. As, and I think that is a matter um, of um, certainly also gender bias um, there, saying that um, she is... Um, um, especially as a woman um, expected to have the moral 
um, the moral, um, perhaps uh, take on that moral role in her family as being a truth teller, especially when she also says that in her travel writing, she would always um, tell the truth. Um, it's especially men actually who have written upon that, um, which I think is quite interesting and that has been used um, against her. As far as I know, um, there have been no productions, but do correct me if I'm wrong, there have been no productions, any popular productions where she is portrayed as an Indian um, or part um, Indian um, writer. And as you say herself, she probably couldn't have done that in her own time because it would have undermined her own um, role uh, that she attributed herself in her writing, named that as a British woman, um, she can criticize in a way um, the Siamese um, court. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it would be highly critical. Uh, it would be highly interesting, and perhaps it would um, bring in a different kind of um, postcolonial perspective into this entire um, ambiguity here. As far as I know, most what most popular productions do is play on her role as a woman, as a British woman, and especially as a private woman with a love interest. And I think that is where we come back to these stereotypes of Victorianism again. Mm -hmm. Again, unless anybody knows any other production or anything that I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. And I think you're the first one who grew up, or the first person that I know who grew up first reading Leonowitz and then seeing The King and I. Most other people that I've met for them, it's the other way around. You first see either the musical or the film, um, and then actually uh, might know that there was a memoir beforehand. <laughs> actually, I grew, I grew up, uh having the stories of David Livingston read to me as well. So the mm -hmm. first uh, the first author you talked about was also of particular interest, uh, especially because she criticized uh, the missionaries, which I thought was just fantastic. Anyway, thank you very much. This has been really interesting. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I left Livingston out uh, because we, this is obviously a, a, a women's uh, travel writing session, but yeah, also highly interesting. Fascinating. Okay. Any any other observations, questions? Ina has a question. I see your hand. Um, yeah. Thanks very much. That that was fascinating. And I was wondering. Um, I'm I'm just reading um, writing poetry, other types of writing by nineteenth century women, and there's one feature that that I'm really struck by: the fact that they publish so much that they publish their poetry. And that they make money by mm -hmm. it. They support their families. And what is the status of these writings that you've shown to us? Is this are these women bettering themselves with these accounts mm -hmm. and uh, financially or in other ways? Mm -hmm. Is this is this a way of making money? Mm -hmm. For some, yes. For some, no. Um, for Anna Leonowens, it became a way of making money. She first made money by being governess, actually. Um, so she went abroad and then she finds herself through that. Um, she left then the um, Siamese court um, and she only gives vague reasons actually why she left. There may have been some um, differences actually uh, between her and um, the king. Um, and then she went to Canada and there she actually started to make money first with lecturing, lecturing about her time abroad and then by writing these um, first um, entries for the journal the Atlantic Monthly and that those were then turned into the memoir so for her yes it was a matter of making money with it for Mary Kingsley it wasn't so much it was actually more um, the um, she had the financial means um, already I think for her it was a matter of marketing both um, her um, scientific exploits, but then also entering that kind of the public market of becoming a public um, figure and um, traveled. So for her, I think it's more a matter of perhaps even um, wanting to become a role model in certain ways, even though she does um, undermine that position of the strong female traveler quite um, in her writing, but I think later on she did have this idea that um, there have to be new 
um, new roles for, for women as well. So I'm not so sure if in her case, if she used it as a means to make money. Leon Owen certainly did, yes, um, but not for um, Mary Kingsley. Isabella Bird, I have to admit, I don't even know. I don't even know whether she made money with that or not. Um, that would be something I would have to look up myself. She wrote so many different um, travel logs to do so many different places, actually, that it may have been a matter of making money, but I'm not so sure. I would have to look up um, what was the case for her. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly a matter that um, for Mary Kingsley, class um, intersects always with her means of being able to write. Um, for Leon Owen's class, actually, I think was a, a reason why she wrote, right? But in both cases, we see the class discourses of always intersecting um, with the, the gender and also the colonial um, discourses as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Fascinating. Excellent. Astu, do you have a question? Okay, thank you very much um, for this uh, um, presentation that was very inspiring. So I just have one question um, that would be um, whether there is any link between travel writing and autobiography. Mm -hmm. I may be wrong, but um, I think that in all their writings, we happen to find some um, some autobiographic elements, um, and I think Kingsley has even talked about her diaries. So mm -hmm. that was why I think about um, a link um, that might exist between autobiography and travel writing. Maybe a second question might be mm -hmm. um, whether um, Kingsley has ever used a pseudonym, because that was also something very common for mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. female writers of the 19th century and i have um, never mm -hmm. um, heard about it so that was uh, my second question thank you so much thank you for both of these questions um i start with the second one i'm not sure i have not come across any pseudonyms for any of these female travelers which is interesting because you're absolutely right saying that that was such a common uh, way to publish in the 19th century why would that not have been the case for female travel writers interesting question my guess would be that a um uh, first of all especially leon owens um, did make it to use money and b if they wanted to write about their travels they had to be famous first as travelers and then um, had to capitalize on that by also using their own name as travel writers and I think that is linked to your first question because it is about the biographical self. Um, there is a link here between um, biographical writing, as you say, absolutely correctly, autobiographical writing and travel writing. How could a travel writer claim to be an eyewitness, to be um, the self that is traveling and then using a pseudonym? Probably that wouldn't go. So I do go together. So I do think your questions are linked in that way. And yes, travel writing is sometimes seen as part of the autobiographical genre. Um, that was, I think, one of the first quotations I gave by Sarah Mills. But it is not a straightforward autobiographical genre. Now, in autobiography, um, usually there's the assumption that the writer um, the physical writer, the one who's actually living, um, is uh, the same or certainly closely linked to the narrative self. That is the idea of the autobiographical genre. And there's also that's linked to this um, idea of the truth, that you have to tell the truth. So if I read an autobiographical work, then I expect this to be truthful, obviously, um, um, as well. That's the autobiographic contract, as it's usually defined. Sarah Mills argues that in travel writing, and especially travel writing by women, we have to be careful about this contract because women oftentimes couldn't write, um, perhaps in the same manner um, as men at the time could write, that there were certain expectations towards women and also certain um, perhaps caveats um, that they had to um, that they had to try and deal with, for instance, this idea that you can't come across as too heroic, you can't come across as too 
adventurous or otherwise you would be seen as masculine. Um, we saw that, for instance, in Mary Kingsley, when she always kind of downplayed her own um, position. So there's a, certainly a link here to autobiography. Um, and I think that's what they capitalize on when they publish under their own names. Um, but at the same time, it's not straightforward autobiographical writing. It's different um, in the sense that they have to market themselves, they have to become um, fictional personas in a way in order to be able to sell their works on the Victorian 19th century um, market. So that I think um, good to link these two questions because they are um, associated or they are linked actually together. Mm -hmm. I think I think a traveler also has the narrator in the foreground sort of the narrator is is admitted you know it's not you know like when you when you write a book about a, a foreign country and you just write about it and you do you talk about facts as facts as facts you know you basically always um sort of um, show your reader how the facts have um, come into existence somehow which yes is, is interesting Travel writing um, as a genre is known for the subjectivity. Um, we had in all three examples here, we had the first person narrative situation. So the focus on the eye, and again, the study of the eye witness as well. It's the eye um, as being an eye, right? But also um, it's the eye that actually sees. So there's a certain sense of um, subjectivity always linked to the travel writer as a, a generic or the travel traveling persona as a, a generic um, persona um, actually here absolutely again mm -hmm. that's one of the ideas and one of the generic features of travel writing mm -hmm. an, an element of uh, authenticity and experience that justify yeah. that you know yeah Absolutely. That's that. not only for the 19th century. We, we know that from Walter Raleigh and numerous other travel writers, obviously, from um, the 16th century onwards, when this idea of authenticity, of um, of truth actually entered travel writing, different from medieval travel writing, medieval travel writing still had idea of monsters and it had to be spec uh, kind of uh, spectacular and it doesn't always have to relate to the truth, right? As long as you write something that interests people, it can be fictitious. So this idea, this sense of truth in travel writing actually only entered um, the genre with the 16th century, with the early modern period, and especially also with um, travel writers who actually went abroad because in the medieval period, if you had numerous armchair travelers um, they didn't actually travel they just wrote about what they had heard about or what someone else said they had heard about and then you collected um, these um, writings and it changed then with hack lloyd and um, other people actually who um, collected what others had actually written about traveling abroad so there is this generic um, development actually from uh, more fictitious writing towards more factual writing by the 19th century here we are almost um, Oh, that's um, after the um, the uh, almost the high point of scientific writing, but we're still there. Actually, um, what we have with Darwin and others—that's a high point of scientific period in travel writing. We're still there in a way that people expect the truth from these travel writers, Fantastic. which changed again then in the 20th century, especially with postmodern writing. You had more of the sense of right can be more playful again about what you experience and uh, and so on. But, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it reminded me of John Smith, you know, as an Americanist. Mm -hmm. I, I only remember the si sentence when he says, I have been an actor. Mm, interesting. This, mm -hmm. You know, this is the whole Pocahontas story, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and he, he really emphasizes, you know, that this is not here tell. Uh, this, is not, this is not just something mm -hmm. you know, that he heard, but he was a participant mm -hmm. in this whole story. So, and, and he yes, emphasized absolutely. that. That was yeah. extremely important. Yes, and quoting other eyewitnesses as well. That's something we also know. That's also the subjectivity of the travel um, writing persona, but also to quote others, to quote other eyewitnesses. That's a central feature also of acknowledging that you tell the truth. So, for instance, in Mary Kingsley, we had references to actual names. That would be this kind of the, the kind of detail um, that you would give in order to 
tell readers or make sure that readers know that I was actually there and I know them, I've met them, I've talked to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or in um, Anna Leo Nowens, we have her reference to her own boy. And then she actually quotes her boy and says kind of, or tells the experience of her boy and what they, or what the boy experienced abroad, right? So not only the um, experience of the self, the travel writing self, but also mm -hmm. the experience of others, but they're always linked to this idea of a truthful narration actually, autobiographical narration um, as we just um, had or as the question just was that's a particular prominent feature fascinating thank you you've taken us into these whole discussions of of genre somehow you know that are that are really interesting and mm -hmm. and the narratology of of all of this mm -hmm. thank you yeah, so again, much. not usually my century but i also really like um this um um, yeah, um, this link between genre and gender here, and then obviously also linked always to colonialism, empire, race, yeah, class. You seem to have. know all of these discovery narratives, you know, that are, of course, also very important. Mm, yeah. The early ones. Fantastic. We have to talk about that sometime. <laughs> Perhaps not today. <laughs> Perhaps yeah, not today. Well, you, you already gave us a lot today. That was wonderful. So is there any... Anybody else who still has a last question? I don't want to exclude anybody. Um, in that case, uh, I just want to thank you everybody for being here tonight um, and listening. And thank you, Kirsten, for a wonderful presentation. That was really nice and it was really good. And uh, I, I let me, yes, let's have some hands here and 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 let me also give a hand to 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 my audience and to all of you who gave talks because we had a lot of volunteers who, who were willing to give a conference a presentation in this uh, lecture cycle and that's a lot of work and and i think that was absolutely wonderful and i'm extremely happy and i just want to share this with you that uh, i had all of this free help um, um, or, you know, contribute to um, um, this extremely rich lecture cycle. And I think it's it's something absolutely wonderful that we are able to produce this um, in the ECO context. And for me, it's something to, to continue fighting for that uh, I hope we can continue doing these kinds of things in the future. So uh, go home and tell everybody that you liked it. Um, in your department and hopefully we'll get uh, more support again and we continue and we can continue this type of thing uh, next year. That would be lovely. And there was just a comment actually. Um, also, thank you to you as an organizer of this lecture series. So perhaps. Uh, yeah. It has been fun. I've oh, met so many interesting uh, people uh, and heard so it. many interesting stories, you know, I guess these are the, the pleasures of academic teaching. <laughs> <laughs> Okie doke. Um, all of this is recorded and there is a link, you know, at the Carl Schwartz house. And I think once all of the links are together, I will contact you again and just send you, you know, the basic folder with the link of all the talks. Um, um, and then maybe you can whatever, save it or remember it or, you know, <laughs> terrific. Okay, so bye bye everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much you. for nice being evening. here, bye. for coming. Um, we had a wonderful time. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Au revoir. <laughs> bye bye.